Now, uh, intracranial hemorrhage uh, and cerebral herniation, it's a, a related topic to the topics that we have already discussed, uh, but it's in a way, it's a separate topic. Uh, that's why I put it uh, under separate heading. Now, intracranial hemorrhages, if you take as the, uh, the umbrella term, then you can divide it into uh, two parts again, intracerebral hemorrhages and extracerebral hemorrhages. Okay. So intracerebral hemorrhages, our main focus today is uh, on extra uh, cerebral hemorrhage, intracranial extracerebral hemorrhages. But uh, to mention a few things about intracerebral hemorrhages, what it means is that there is bleeding into the, uh, the substance of the brain you know, or into the ventricles of the brain. So this uh, bleeding into the substance of the brain, brain, you call it intraparenchyma. You know what is meant by parenchyma. Parenchyma is the... Uh, is the tissues or cells of the uh, organ, okay, main cells of an organ. So it can be into the brain substance, intraparenchymal or intraventricular bleeding. Now, usually what happens is a large percentage of maybe about 40%, if you think about intraparenchymal hemorrhages that originally bleed into the, uh, the substance of the brain, uh, later uh, they get extended into the uh, ventricular system. Okay, rather than directly uh, getting bleeding into the ventricular system, you get uh, intraparenchymal bleeding extending into the ventricular system, so they can be uh, together. Okay, not separately. Okay, most of the time, just remember that. So that is intracerebral hemorrhage. We will not discuss further about it. Uh, so this is coming under strokes. So one type of strokes is um, not having blood supply. Uh, that is uh, ischemic stroke. Then the other one is hemorrhagic stroke. Okay, hemorrhagic means bleeding. Okay, so this is type of a hemorrhagic stroke. So we will not discuss that any further. Okay, that's a separate topic. Then about the extracerebral hemorrhages. Now here, here onwards, when we say intracranial hemorrhage, we will be referring to intracranial extracerebral hemorrhages in our discussion. Uh, can be of three main types. So that is, you know, depending on the spaces that we have discussed. He said there are three meningeal spaces, epidural or extradural space, subdural space and subarachnoid space. So when there's bleeding, extracerebral, intracranial, extracerebral bleeding, it can only happen into a, a space that is already available or potential space. Okay, so only spaces available are these three. So the bleeding also uh, uh, will be into these three spaces. Okay, epidural, subdural, or subarachnoid is simple. Okay. Uh, now, this, uh, you know, one uh, CT film related to the first category, intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, you can see this blood clot here very clearly. Okay. Now, this is how you understand this. Now, this is a CT film. Now, see how you see the brain, the normal brain and the skull in the CT film. This is the skull. It looks very white, just like the background here. Okay. As white as that, because the skull is radio opaque. Because in CTs you use X-rays, okay, and this is the brain. It is radio loosened, so it appears a little bit dark, okay. So you can see a very clear contrast between the skull and the brain. Now what happens here? Fresh blood. When there's fresh blood, fresh blood is uh, the radio opaque, and it appears like bone, okay. Fresh blood appears white like bone, and old blood. If you have bleeding and you know if the blood clot has been there for several weeks or months, then this would appear darker. This would appear darker. It would appear more like the brain than the skull. Okay. So it, it, then you know uh, the point here is if there is old bleeding, uh, unless you are very careful, you will get confused between brain substance and the blood clot. Not like this one. Very straightforward. The moment you look at it. You will either say it's a part of the bone inside the brain, okay, or you would say that um, uh, if you know it, you will say that it's fresh bleeding, okay, acute bleeding into the brain. Here you can see the lateral ventricles filled with uh, fresh blood, okay, uh, whitish appearance. So that's that's enough uh, for the moment, and and you can see here the midline. You can see the midline shifted like this, okay, uh, and here you see the, the midline. Uh, this uh, ventricular system has sh be shifted. Here, here you you have uh, you can see that the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle totally uh, obstructed. You know, it's uh, collapsed. And this is the other opposite side, anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. 
So this is the midline, how it has shifted. Okay. So this is due to raised pressure on this side of the bleeding. Okay. So this is all intracerebral hemorrhages. Okay. Okay. Then the first one, uh, uh, in, intracranial extracerebral hemorrhages. So the first one is this one. So you have the extradural or epidural hemorrhage. Now, uh, the extradural hemorrhages, now the bleeding happens into this space, you know now, you have the skull here. So this is uh, the outer table and the inner table of skull. Then you have the, the dura mater attached to the skull actually, okay, attached to the skull. Uh, now the bleeding, uh, bleeding takes place between the dura mater, uh, uh, outer layer of dura mater and the inner table of the skull. And anyway, it is attached, therefore, the blood clot that develops, it develops under pressure, okay, under a little bit of pressure. It cannot just freely fill, okay. So because of this thing, you know, it gets separated out very slowly uh, under pressure. So, you know, you get a clot developing like this. The edges are, uh, edges are narrow, okay. Center is large, okay. It's biconvex shape. We'll discuss that later anyway. So anyway, the space is this. Now, the point here is, you get vessels called meningeal vessels between the dura mater and arachnoid mater. Okay. Between the uh, dura mater and the skull. Between the skull and the dura mater. Inner table of skull and um, endosteal layer of dura mater. You get uh, blood vessels. They are called meningeal uh, arteries. Now, when it comes to extradural hemorrhage, most of the bleeding, about 75%, is the meaning middle meningeal artery that is responsible. So, this is an image of the middle meningeal artery you see here. Uh, on the lateral side. Now here when the, the, the skull is cut and removed, you can see the, the dura mater is intact. So this is the industrial layer of dura mater that you see here. It has been uh, torn out from the, uh, the, the vault of the skull. Okay. And, and the blood vessel that was there between the dura mater and the uh, inner table of the skull has gone onto the side of the dura mater here. Okay. Uh, so you see it. Uh, this vessel has two divisions actually. The main one is the anterior division. This is the middle meningeal artery coming up. This is the anterior division and this is the posterior division. Okay, it's usually the anterior division that gets affected. Okay, not the posterior one. Okay, so anterior one is this one. Posterior one is this one. Okay. Uh, so usually it happens after a hard blow to the head. Either, you know, someone hitting or you falling from a height or road traffic accident or whatever and uh, okay we already mentioned this where the clot gets uh, collected uh, so it's called the collection of blood is called hematoma okay blood clot okay now this uh, the same area from the inner aspect of the skull now the brain and the dura mater has been removed in this uh, one you see the grooving on the inner table of the skull for these blood vessels okay now this area of the skull where they have encircled is called terion, terion of the skull, which happens to be the weakest point of the skull. If the weakest point of the skull, uh, and underneath that, you actually get the, uh, the mainly the anterior division of the um, mening meningeal uh, artery, middle meningeal uh, artery. Uh, so, if you have forgotten uh, what middle meningeal artery is, it's a branch of the uh, the, of the, uh, the of the maxillary artery. Uh, maxillary artery is a branch of the external carotid artery. Uh, so it enters the cranial cavity through the foramen spinosum. Okay, foramen spinosum, and there's a groove for that artery. So it passes through that groove. So just to remind you, this is your uh, external carotid artery. Okay, and this is your uh, superficial temporal artery. Uh, and this is your maxillary artery. And from the maxillary, you get the middle meningeal uh, entering the cranial cavity through the foramen spinosa. Okay. Uh, so I think it's clear enough to you all. So uh, this is another diagram from the lateral aspect of the skull. Um, so you have the terion here. Now the, the, the position of the terion is, uh, I'll take this out. I don't know where to keep it. Okay, now uh, the position of the terion is this. Now you here is your temple. Okay, this is an English term. Uh, it's behind your uh, eye. Uh, now 
immediately behind the temple, immediately behind the, your temple is somewhere here. Okay. So immediately behind the temple, uh, it is this dangerous area which is called the Tyrion of the skull. Now at the Tyrion, the special thing is why it is so weak at the Tyrion is that uh, the frontal bone, the parietal bone, temporal and sphenoid bones, all four bones, frontal, parietal, sphenoid, greater wing of sphenoid and the temporal bones, they all unite. All four bones unite at the Tyrion. That's why it's a weak, uh, it has become a weak uh, place. Okay, so after a head injury, uh, if you uh, if you feel a boggy mass, boggy mass means a mass a swelling. When you press it, when you press the swelling, uh, it's soft. Okay, if you get a boggy mass in that area of your uh, head, then uh, the doctor should uh, really suspect fracture of the terion. Okay, and it is the anterior division of the middle meningeal that runs underneath the. Tyrion. Okay, remember this point is a very frequently asked uh, point by the clinicians. Okay. Um, so then what happens is in extradural hemorrhage, epidural hemorrhage, when the skull breaks, there's a fracture there. Okay, if there's a fracture there, uh, damaging the inner table, uh, the, uh, with that, you know, grooving of the inner table by the artery and all, when the bone breaks like this, artery also breaks with that. Okay. And uh, arterial bleeding is anyway under pressure. So they can, they have the ability to separate the dura mater from the inner table of the skull. Okay. Inner table of the skull, giving rise to this blood clot, which is, you know, biconvex. Okay. It's biconvex. It's a biconvex blood clot because its bleeding is under pressure. Okay. Um, now, uh, if this is not drained, extradural hemorrhage, since it's arterial bleeding, uh, they can develop. Uh, 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 hematoma quickly and the intracranial pressure can go up because the cranial cavity is a closed cavity. When there is uh, blood adding into the cavity, getting collected in the cavity, pressure immediately increases, okay, rapidly increases and the brain can get compressed, okay. So this is a nice uh, CT film of an extradural hemorrhage. Now look at the position, it's related to the, uh, the side of the uh, the skull. So, very likely it's from the middle meningeal vessels. Now, again, uh, the points that I raised, you see the uh, the, uh, the color of the blood. So, it's fresh blood, whitish appearance like bone and you see the uh, the brain tissue gets comp compressed, okay, pushed uh, pushed aside uh, and you see the midline here. Now, this is the, this is the right anterior horn and the, the left uh, anterior horn. So, right and left anterior horns. So, the midline has been shifted. Okay, midline has been shifted. Even here, you can see it. Okay. Uh, then the subdural hematoma, the other, other type of bleeding, subdural. So, uh, in subdural hematoma, in contrast to the extradural hematoma, here it is venous bleeding. Here it is venous. Uh, bleeding now it's mostly it's, it happens in old people okay not that always it happens in old people old people are more vulnerable old people are more vulnerable now the point is this now you have your uh, cranial cavity like this cranial cavity like this and your brain is here okay in old age brain undergoes atrophy Atrophy means brain cells die, millions and millions of nerve cells die in old age and the brain becomes physically small. Um, now, if the brain becomes small now like this, okay, uh, the gap between the, the, the skull and the bro bone, the, the brain, skull and the brain is more now because of this shrinking of the brain. Then I told you about this bridging veins, veins that uh, travel from the the, the brain substance into the, uh, the, the superior sagittal sinus. Uh, they cross the subarachnoid space and subdural space. Now, now the subdural space is all this time, it's a potential space that's closed up, but with the shrinking of the brain, you can have opening up of the subdural space. So it's possible that the veins break in the subdural space. Rather than in the subarachnoid space, they break in the subdural space because of the attachment here to the uh, the, the, the the dura and the venous sinus. So it's easy to break there, closer to the attachment. So if that happens, there will be relatively slow bleeding, 
slow bleeding into the uh, subdural space. Okay, relatively slow bleeding into the subdural space uh, because the arachnoid mater is anyway not attached to the dura mater like the way the dura mater is attached to the inner table of the skull. Okay, so it's venous bleeding, that is one thing. Second thing is the, the blood clot, the hematoma develops under very low pressure. Okay, that's why veins can easily bleed into that space. Now, the, therefore, the, the, if the brain is like this, okay, blood clot will not be like that, like in the extradural hemorrhage. So, it will follow the shape of the brain, you know, it will be crescent shape like this, okay. It follows the shape of the brain, but anyway, it will push the brain. If the clot is large, gradually, will only, it will only happen gradually. So, you know, what happens is the usual uh, presentation of the patient is that uh, they usually they have forgotten the incident also. So say they fall from a height or something, hit the head against something. And uh, then, you know, uh, after some time it settles, they forget it after several days or even after weeks, they develop a headache, uh, drowsiness, and sometimes vomiting. Then they have, usually they fo have forgotten the incident also now. Okay, because the bleeding is very slow. Uh, so then uh, if you do a CT film, then you will detect the subdural uh, hematoma. So, in children also, this can happen uh, due to child battering, okay, child battering, uh, in the sense, you know, you uh, serve a certain parents and guardians, uh, they have psychiatric problems, so they are alcoholics, they, 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 they hit their children, they hit them on the head and they sometimes shake, shake the children, okay. Uh, so, if they do it vigorous shaking, uh, again, you know, uh, even in small age, these things can happen, okay, uh, subdural hematomas so they are the, the they are not as quickly developing as extradural hematoma remember that point uh, and it is uh, sickle shaped okay uh, sickle or crescent shaped okay like this so this is how you see a subdural hematoma you might not be uh, able to identify it even if you don't look at it very carefully now here now you can see the midline here just look at it here so this is the midline now you see how much these things have shifted Okay, now the posterior horn, both posterior horns are on the left side. Now, whatever the lesion that is there on the right side. Now, look at the surface of the brain. You follow the surface of the brain here. Okay, so this is the surface of the brain, like this. Okay, so this whole area is a extra, uh, the subdural hematoma. Subdural hematoma. Now, why you can't recognize it easily? It's like grain now, because it's old blood. Okay, it's not uh, white, whitish like the, uh, the bone. Uh, it's all uh, old blood uh, gradually developed here. Okay, so this this whole thing is subdural uh, hematoma here, the brain. Because here the difference is you see the salsi here, you don't see salsa in this one. Okay, even though it appears like brain, you don't see salsi. You, very clearly, if you look at this, you can see salsi uh, on the side of the brain, uh, but not uh, in the blood clot. Okay. Then uh, the, the subarachnoid hemorrhage leading into the subarachnoid space. Uh, again, you know, it's like uh, extradural hemorrhage. It is usually arterial bleeding rather than venous bleeding. Not that venous blood, uh, venous veins cannot bleed into the subarachnoid space. They can bleed, but uh, if you go by the commonness, it is usually due to arterial bleeding. Because the reason is uh, most of the cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage is not due to injuries unless it is a severe injury uh, which gives rise to other uh, hemorrhages as well it is usually due to rupture of a, uh, an aneurysm rupture of an aneurysm uh, of an artery that's why it becomes arterial bleeding and usually these aneurysms are they are genetic partly called berry aneurysms berry aneurysms uh, i don't know whether you have learned about the blood supply of the brain yet uh, blood supply comes uh, rises mainly from the circle of willies uh, you get your anterior cerebral arteries like this with anterior communicating arteries. Then you have the uh, your internal carotid uh, becomes you know middle cerebral. Uh, so you have the anterior cerebral like this. Then then you have the posterior communicating and posterior uh, cerebral arteries here and the basilar artery. Okay, so it's a circle. Now all these junctions where the branches are given off are vulnerable sites for uh, aneurysms. Okay. 
because when the blood flows uh, with uh, angles like this, you can develop an aneurysm uh, at that uh, places because the blood is turbulent. Okay, the blood becomes turbulent like this uh, when they take uh, bends. Okay, so the belly aneurysms can, uh, if a person with belly belly aneurysms uh, in in small age, it will not matter because the pressure is under control. Like when the persons get older. When the person develops high blood pressure, okay, if there's high blood pressure, especially uh, very aneurysms can rupture. But that does not mean that they cannot rupture in a uh, child, in children. It's possible, but it's more common in uh, adults with high blood pressure. They can rupture, and then the bleeding will be into the uh, subarachnoid space. And as we said before, then blood will uh, mix with the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, there is a concept called, you know, xanthochromia. We used to learn it in biochemistry. If there is uh, bleeding into the CSF, uh, say, uh, sometime back, a uh, few days back, and then if you look at CSF, for some reason, if you take CSF, and, uh, you might find xanthochromia. But I said before, you can't do lumbar puncture when there is uh, raised intracranial pressure. Uh, because here, what happens is uh, the subarachnoid hemorrhage, unlike uh, the previous two cases, they come with severe headache. Okay, they come with severe headache uh, and neck stiffness. Then the people will suspect meningitis. Okay, meningitis. Uh, and they, then when they do want to take CSF for diagnosis, uh, then they sometimes find it because here the here a case they have missed uh, as subarachnoid hemorrhage, but later they find this. So it's not very important, I think. Okay. Uh, so pay, the patients with the uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, they have, as I said, severe headache and uh, neck stiffness. You type uh, neck stiffness in the internet and find what it is. Okay, you get the person to lie down on a bed, uh, supine, uh, face looking towards the ceiling. You try to raise. You ask the person to relax the neck muscles, and you try to raise the neck uh, over the uh, away from the pillow, and uh, it goes back reflexly. Okay, that is neck neck stiffness. This is due to irritation of nerve roots which pass through the meninges before they come out okay um, so same thing happens in meningitis okay inflammation of the meninges okay now this is what happens in subarachnoid hemorrhage you can see uh, subarachnoid space is a, a space where blood can uh, freely flow here and there because anyway there is csf in that space so then you will have uh, blood um, uh, in the csf uh, it's a parachnoid space. Only thing is, you get severe headache because of irritation of the nerves passing through the subarachnoid space. Then the other important point is uh, now this is a uh, actual picture of a brain with subarachnoid hemorrhage. It can spread all over, and you can see uh, now. Uh, now, since uh, uh, pyometer, as we said before, passes into the sulci like this. Uh, blood here will easily go into the sulci. So blood will fill the sulci. Okay, blood will fill the sulci. If, the, if there are a lot of blood, blood will be here on the surface as well as inside the sulci. Okay, so that can be seen even in a CT film very nicely. Now here you can see the lateral sulcus here. Blood has gone through the lateral sulcus to fill the, uh, the, the, the area outside the insular cortex. You know this insular cortex, we discussed it yesterday. So you see this whitish appearance, okay, like worms inside the, uh, or, or in the surface of the brain. So you see all these whitish areas, okay. And even in the uh, posterior horn, you see some uh, blood, it has, you know, come back into the uh, ventricular system. So here also here, you see blood here, blood here, and all this brain substance, which is usually dark has become here whitish. These areas has become here all these sulci, uh, whitish appearance and even inside you get whitish appearance. This is clear uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage um, leaking into the ventricular system as well. Uh, then uh, cerebral herniation. Now these hemorrhages, especially extradural hemorrhages and subdural hemorrhages, they give rise to, they increase the pressure inside the cranial cavity, which is called raised intracranial pressure. And when the pressure increases, uh, now you take the 
the dura mater the, 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 if you take the cranial cavity if this is the cranial cavity now dura mater divides this cranial cavity you have an opening here tentorial opening and uh, you have the hallux cerebri here so you have uh, this is the area for the cerebral middle and anterior cranial fossae and this is the area for the cerebellum posterior cranial fossa now this is like a wall tentorium cerebelli here you have the phallic cerebri here so these are like you know separate compartments okay so you have uh, an upper compartment all together which is a supra tentorial compartment above the tentorium cerebelli then there is an infra tentorial infra tentorial compartment okay so this is supra tentorial and infra tentorial then other than that because of the phallic cerebri here okay uh, the upper compartment or the uh, supra tentorial compartment is partially divided into left and right sides okay left and right sides so when the pressure when the pressure increases now because of this reason if the pressure increases here above the tentorium cerebelli things can herniate through the opening of the tentorium cerebelli from the uh, the, the middle cranial fossa uh, into the uh, anyway the upper part into the lower part into the posterior cranial fossa on the other hand if there is pressure developing on one side the brain in that side tends to herniate to the opposite side okay before they herniate down okay so because of this you know uh, there are different her herniations are defined so this is since it passes under the phallic cerebri you can call it sub phallicine herniation sub means underneath that and if it passes down through the tentorial opening, you call it trans tentorial herniation. Then you have an opening here, the foramen magnum, large opening. Uh, at final stages, if you don't do anything or any of these things, then the pressure increases very high, intracranial pressure. And then, uh, but to get here is the cerebellum, parts of the cerebellum can herniate down uh, through the foramen magnum, okay, which is called foraminal. Uh, transforaminal herniation okay uh, so these are the types of herniations that you get uh, there can be other types of herniation but these are the main ones that i will talk to you about okay so you can actually see some of these herniations here we'll take one by one so this is uh, uh, sub sign this is trans uh, tentorial herniation okay um, this one okay uh, then here, you know, this is after fracture, you can get the brain herniating out. This is uh, transforaminal herniation. Okay, some of the things you, know, you might not need. Okay, so this is a, 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 a coronal section of a brain uh, of a person who died of um, um, raised intracranial pressure. Uh, this one, you can see here, this is a sub sign herniation. Your phallic cerebri is somewhere here. So this side, if this is right side, um, the, the brain has herniated under the phallic cerebri to the opposite side. Okay. Now, in these cases, you know, one thing that can happen is due to this herniation, uh, you have the anterior cerebral arteries here. The same side, if this is right side, right anterior cerebral artery can get obstructed because of pressure developing on that side first. Okay. Now, if now that anterior cerebral artery, if you remember the blood supply of the brain, supplies this whole area. Okay. This whole area, even outside, you know, you get an area supplied here. And especially this middle area is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. Now, uh, now if this happens in the, uh, the pre-motor area, the, the motor area, motor cortex, uh, this is the lower limb area. Okay. Foot. You get the foot represented here. Your foot and the uh, lower part of the leg represented in that area so you get uh, opposite side contralateral leg weakness foot and you know leg weakness due to obstruction of the ipsilateral uh, anterior cerebral artery okay so the midline shift okay so these are the points about sign herniation it is the most common cerebral herniation because that is the initial one that happens and usually they are asymptomatic okay uh, headache may or may not be there so as i said before ipsilateral anterior cerebral artery can get occluded with contralateral leg weakness leg and foot weakness okay um, and you know what you need to remember is that 
in a, in a patient with say uh, uh, maybe a tumor even uh, which has been there for a long time or after head injury uh, if they develop uh, leg weakness leg or foot weakness you should you know consider uh, a possible herniation inside after raised intracranial pressure okay remember that point then the trans transtentorial herniation uh, when there is herniation through the uh, opening of the the tentorium uh, cerebelli like this tentorium cerebelli what happens is uh, it is this part that herniates i don't know whether you remember this uh, now this is the parahippocampal gyrus uh, part of the parahippocampal gyrus is the uncus here the parahippocampal gyrus and the uncus which actually lies at the edge here at the edge of the uh, the, the opening of the tentorium here can herniate through the opening of the tentorium okay and uh, you get the oculomotor nerve there your third cranial nerve is very close to that area because it comes out from the midbrain i said the midbrain passes through this mainly okay so here you get the thalamus and you get midbrain is here okay so what happens is the oculomotor nerve can get compressed between the herniating part of the brain uncus or parahippocampal gyrus um, between that and the edge of the tentorium cerebelli and when the third cranial nerve gets compressed initially what happens is uh, you get uh, the same side uh, pupil gets constricted initially then it dilates so now what happens is you get the um, you get the parasympathetic nerve like this it has two functional components you have inside you get somatic inside you get somatic component outside you get parasympathetic component okay this is how the nerve is away you get the parasympathetic component now that parasympathetic component um, uh, constricts the pupil okay so the pupil you have circular muscles like this and radial muscles like that radial muscles are supplied by the sympathetic system circular muscles so sphincter muscles are supplied by the parasympathetic so what happens is when the oculomotor nerve gets compressed uh, so the compression comes from outside initially you know it comes from outside so initially what what happens with these autonomic nerves is when you when you compress them to some extent little extent they get stimulated okay so you get the constriction of the pupil uh, initially which no one will detect okay it's, it will be there only for a short time then with further compression then you get the nerve fibers stop functioning okay you get the uh, nerve palsy then you get the dilatation of the pupil. So usually what you, uh, you see these patients at dilatation stage rather than mm -hmm. constriction stage. Uh, and then uh, you know the, the oculomotor nerve, it, uh, it, it, uh, it supplies parasympathetic to the pupil as well as somatic component to the extraocular muscles like your medial rectus, uh, superior rectus, all that. Okay, many of the extraocular muscles are supplied by the um, oculomotor nerve so you get extraocular muscle paralysis and you can get double vision uh, and all that okay um, then the other point is in severe cases uh, it's not only the nerve that get compressed because of the herniation uh, through this small opening here even the midbrain parts of the midbrain can get compressed so here the, the most important one are the cerebral peduncles which carries ascending and descending nerve tracts okay now this is a very nice example of that now this is the midbrain this is the midbrain here this is the midbrain that has got compressed see see the shape of it here so this is the herniating part of the uh, uncus and the parahippocampal gyrus of the temporal lobe okay so that has compressed uh, to a large extent and you can see the third cranial nerve was oculomotor nerve uh, in that area okay third cranial nerve okay uh, so remember this you know we you can be asked you know questions uh, on this uh. then the tonsillar tonsillar herniation which is called transforaminal herniation now why you call it tonsillar herniation now if you uh, remember the structure of the cerebellum i don't know whether you have done it cerebellum uh, you uh, cerebellum like this and you have what are called tonsils like this okay uh, so these are the cerebellar tonsils they lie just above the foramen magnum. So when the pressure increases uh, uh, on the upper compartment and if it was not um, treated, uh, the pressure will transmit down into the posterior cranial fossa 
and the, the, the tonsils of the cerebellum will herniate down through the foramen magnum uh, and that uh, the issue is not on the tonsils but the issue is on the brain stem there okay uh, the medulla uh, in that area gets compressed due to this herniation because there is not sp enough space in the foramen magnum uh, for the herniating part and the brain stem for both you get uh, all important centers in that area cardiac center respiratory center so they can get obstructed and you know uh, the, you know, at this stage, if you see a patient, it's very late, I think. Okay. So you get with um, you know, changes in the heart rate, grasping, you know, um, uh, and all that. Okay. And they will be unconscious and all because you get your uh, reticular formation also there. So when they get compressed, your alertness uh, goes away, you get unconscious. Okay. Uh, they are very late stages. Uh, and the other thing is central canal because of this compression. You get CSF circulation. So the central canal is the canal inside the spinal cord. You remember, which is connected to the fourth ventricle. Somewhere here, you get the, uh, the central canal. Because of this compression, this also gets compressed and closed up. So, you know, you can get uh, hydrocephalus. Okay, but you know, that's a, uh, that's a late uh, you know, thing. Then, you know, uh, this is the last slide. Now, the consequences or oh, sequence of events, sorry. Sequence of events following um, extradural hemorrhage, usually, you know, intracranial hemorrhage, but it's mainly extradural hemorrhage. Just know it, this is a clinical thing, but it's interesting to uh, know this. Now, initially, let's say a person falls from a height, hits the head against something, and initially the person gets unconscious. Why? Because the, there's shaking of the uh, nerve fibers uh, and cells inside. You get a temporary unconsciousness, okay? Uh, and then the person recovers after a few minutes. Uh, the patient recovers and he looks looks all normal. Okay, uh, and uh, and th those who are around and the patient itself will think that the issue is over. And that interval is called lucid interval. Okay, because that he is passing through a phase that is uh, seen like normal but is not normal. Then after some time, maybe you know several hours, he will become drowsy. Okay, he will become drowsy. Uh, why? Because uh, at the time of the blow, uh, there has been a fracture, okay, fracture uh, of the skull and extradural hemorrhage has started, okay. When the, the blood clot develops, the, when the hematoma develops, the pressure increases, intracranial, uh, intracranial pressure increases and uh, that will actually, uh, that is the reason for drowsiness due to the compression of the brain. Then, uh, then, you know, if there is, you know, compression of the uh, oculomotor nerve, as I said before, initially it can constrict, it, you might not detect, but obviously later it will dilate and, you know, with further dilatation, it will be fixed, fixed in the sense, if you flash a now, dilated pupil, if you flash a torch to a dilated pupil, uh, it will constrict, okay. So, but uh, this pupil will not constrict, okay, it will remain dilated, so that is called fixed, okay. Uh, the pupillary light reflex is absent. Okay. Then initially the pulse can go up. So if you see a person with head injury and high pulse rate, okay, very high pulse rate, then you su should suspect um, increased intracranial pressure. Now what happens is inside the cranial cavity, uh, where you get the brain and the brain stem and all that, when the pre pressure increases, intracranial pressure increases, uh, the blood supply to the intracranial cavity becomes less because, you know, the heart has to pump against this pressure. And the, when the blood supply to the cardiac center in the brain stem reduces, it will detect it as uh, having a person having a low blood pressure. So it will send impulses to increase, sympathetic impulses to increase the heart rate. Okay. So cardiac center will send inputs to the cardiac uh, the, the, hard to increase the rate so you get the pulse rate increasing initially now what happens is when the heart rate goes up blood pressure goes up that's natural no? if you write the equation for blood pressure heart rate is there peripheral resistance is there okay then um, when the blood pressure goes up you have baroreceptors in the neck to detect blood pressure baroreceptors will detect blood pressure and reduce the heart rate again okay so what happens is initially the, the heart, the pulse rate or heart rate goes up. 
then the blood pressure later blood pressure increases then the uh, heart rate goes down pulse rate goes down which is called cushing reflex okay pressure high pulse low okay that's that's a, that that's a secondary event because of the narrow receptor uh, mechanism so this is called cushing reflex you will learn this uh, in physiology lectures so after head injury uh, if it is a severe blow to the head it's best at least for 24 hours or 48 hours if you want you monitor the person's uh, blood pressure pulse respiration and the pupil the size of the pupil and its reaction to light um, and if you have any any doubt you should immediately do ct scan okay you do ct scan because x-rays will not show you uh, blood okay x-rays will not show you blood inside the cranial cavity okay only ct films will show it 